Hey everyone, and welcome to another episode of the Hayek Program Podcast. While you're listening to this episode, if you think of someone who you know would benefit from listening to it, we'd love to have you share the episode with them. Maybe as you're grabbing lunch together, or even just with a quick text. Word of mouth is the primary way that we grow the reach of the podcast, and we'd be honored to have your help as we work to provide these conversations for other lifelong learners. Thanks once again for listening to the podcast, and with that, let's get to the episode. You're listening to the Hayek Program Podcast. This podcast includes audio from lectures, interviews, and discussions from scholars and visitors of the F.A. Hayek Program for Advanced Study in Philosophy, Politics, and Economics at the Mercatus Center at George Mason University. To learn more about the Hayek program, visit hayek.mercatus.org. To learn about graduate student fellowship opportunities with the Mercatus Center at George Mason University for students at Mason as well as at universities across the globe, please visit students.mercatus.org. We're here today. It's early October 2022. I'm with Professor uh, Scott Bullier, who is the Ronald and uh, Kay Olson Dean at the School of Business at University of Wyoming. Uh, prior to that, Scott was the Dean at North Dakota State University. And prior to that, he was a professor and executive director at centers at, AS, at Arizona State University, Troy University, and Mercer University. Scott, thanks for taking the time to come, come on here with me. Absolutely, Pete. Great to hear your voice and see you. So Scott, I wanted to first ask you about your origin story, how you got interested in economics, uh, uh, the passion that you have for teaching economics, which, uh, you know, I'm going to spoil it a little bit, I think was born out of your experience tutoring uh, economics, uh, you know, as an under, uh, when you were an undergraduate, you worked doing that. Um, and, uh, you know, so just start with that and how you got interested in economics, uh, uh, you know, at, Mich- at Northern Michigan. Sure. Uh, so I'm a, a poor kid born in uh, Michigan's Upper Peninsula, hometown of uh, Tom Izzo and Steve Mariucci, uh, Iron Mountain, Michigan. Go Spartans, uh, two hours north of Green Bay, Wisconsin, and uh, first in my family to have consumed college um, at all and uh, went to a directional school, Northern Michigan University, that was 90 miles from home. So I was working full time as a student. Um, I started at McDonald's in high school and worked all through college, was in management, thought I was headed towards a life as a uh, as a McDonald's manager or maybe even a store owner um, that the, the corporate team at McDonald's was um, trying to send me to Hamburger University, which it exists. It's in Illinois. Uh, I was an effective manager, but um, had no aspirations for a life in higher education like that was the far the farthest thing. It was another planet um, for someone like me. Uh, a lot of the kids in my class tried college, um, didn't succeed, and just boomeranged back um, home or into um, places where they could just get blue collar jobs. So I went to Northern, was just thinking um, Northern would be a place to get a degree. And that's something that was being encouraged by the mid 1990s, but didn't really have any direction, was kicking around with a lot of different majors. Uh, took one class and it was the only class, the only section that was not full. And the reason it wasn't full is there was this new professor uh, coming to Northern Michigan that nobody really knew anything about. So the other sections, everyone knew the devil that they were going to deal with and signed up for them. Uh, This section was open. Uh, It was a guy named Perchitko uh, that was uh, teaching the class. And uh, I signed up for it. It was a 9 a.m. class. And uh, the very first couple of meetings, this guy was different. Unbelievable energy, uh, really passionate about um, the ideas and brought economics to life for me in a way that it hadn't been brought in high school. Uh, Economics was very dry in high school. You were focused mainly on the stock market and the supply and demand curves were just brutal uh, in terms of trying to understand and make sense out of and uh, Dave was uh, um, just the right, that one right class at the right time and changed my life. I mean, he's up there and maybe the top three people uh, in my life ever uh, in terms of owing gratitude to and um, just, uh, uh, you know, just extreme, um, uh, you know, inability to repay ever for um, turning me on to econ. And after that, the, uh, the rest we can get into is history. I succeeded as an undergraduate student. 
uh, became a tutor uh, at Northern Michigan University, fell in love with my, li- my wife uh, as a tutor. So I, have, I can credit Econ and Dave to finding my <laughs> wife uh, and uh, then moved on to uh, George Mason and uh, met you. Yeah, well, uh, I want to ask you a couple questions about Northern first, because uh, uh, Northern had, has a long tradition of UCLA uh, you know, property rights. And Dave uh, returned to Northern. He was a undergraduate similar to yourself, got turned on to economics, originally what there not to study economics, but then had a similar experience with his professors. And then he was gone for, you know, roughly 10 years or whatever. And then they brought him back to be chairman uh, and, and to and to build on this UCLA tradition. How live and of was that when in retrospect, maybe you didn't know that when you were a freshman or whatever, first learning, but, you know, the emphasis on property rights, the emphasis on institutional evolution, uh, contracting, all of that stuff. Was that throughout all of your classes? Yeah, it was. Uh, there were a couple of other professors um, that were near the end of their career, a guy named Zaki, who loved Milton Friedman. Um, another guy who had studied under Elshin named Howard Swain, who taught law and economics. Uh, and then Tani Ferrarini was there and had been uh, a student of Doug North. So there was a strong tradition of new institutional econ, um, property rights econ. Um, I took a lot of my classes um, from Dave uh, just because, uh, um, I mean, he was really good. Uh, you know, the other classes just conflicted. You know, I was doing an econ major um, jointly with a history major, which was that was an artifact of previous decisions and then almost a math major. So it was really just a, a constrained scheduling problem in some respects. Uh, but outside of econ, um, another thing that was interesting about that moment at NMU is they were located with history and philosophy all on the same floor of their um, offices. So you'd go for office hours and I'd run into Dave in the uh, in the hallway um, arguing with philosophers right across the uh, hallway from him. And they were having just these really rich conversations about Locke and Mill, Habermas. And uh, it was uh, an amazing place to just be around as a student. I mean, so much has changed with office hours and just people being in the building. But back in the mid-1990s, everyone was there all day. And uh, if you went to office hours... You got to encounter Jim Green and uh, Jim Cooper and a lot of people who um, were just very generous with their time. Yeah, I, I'm, I mean, it's an unusual thing. And, and I didn't, we didn't mention earlier, but Dave Perchicko and I, you know, went to graduate school together and we were best buddies. And, um, and uh, here's how the like life worked. We took classes on Monday through Thursday All of our classes were at 7.30 to 10 o'clock at night. So we would get to the office in the mornings and then we would just study all day long. And then on Fridays was the seminar. So we came in for the seminar. And then on Saturdays, Dave and I would work for half a day, you know, and then Julie and Rosemary, our our significant others, they would, you know, meet us. And then we'd do something like go uh, get pizza and go out to the movies or something like that. Right. And, um, the thing about it was all the professors were there too, because there wasn't the internet, there wasn't, you know, and, and so that's where they worked. And so we would run into them, we'd have a problem, like on a problem set, or we were reading an article that, you know, we didn't under fully understand, Dave and I would either have each other, or we would have, you know, the other professors and everything. And when I, when I uh, became a professor myself, I, I didn't realize how much time like Don LaVoy spent with us until until I was a professor and students would come and talk to me while I was trying to grade or prepare for a lecture. And I'm like, what the hell are you in my class, <laughs> you know, my way for? I got to do stuff. And Don never did any of that. So uh, Dave, but Dave and I had great conversations. And uh, anyway, so anyway, as you mentioned already, um, I had moved to George Mason University in 1998 and I uh, a new a new center program was set up. Uh, called uh, the James M. Buchanan Center. Um, and I was put in charge of working on student programs here. And you were one of my, you might be actually my first recruit because Dave, uh, excuse me, uh, uh, Virgil and Ed Stringham just happened to move the same year that I came in. Uh, then there is a year in between uh, because you're entering the class of 2000, right? Yeah. So the 1999 class, I think we might not have had many fellowships yet. 
and I think just two of my students that studied with me at NYU decided to come down. That was uh, Ferruccio Magatelli and Christine Pollack. If I'm, my memory might be wrong, but I think I think they're 1999. Um, but then you came in, and we had moved the seminar, the Austrian seminar that I was involved with up at NYU, from NYU to FI. Um, and, uh, you went to that, uh, and I got a chance to meet you. Obviously I was told about your great prowess from your mentor back at Northern. And, uh, so you were the target of our recruiting efforts. Um, so I think of this as like me being Tom Izzo and wanting to, you know, get, uh, you know, Mateen Cleaves or whatever, one of the guys who helped them win a national championship, uh, and, uh, we were fortunate enough to get you there. Um, you had choices. So what made you decide at the end to come to GMU? You. <laughs> <laughs> it's that simple. Uh, no, I, uh, I, yeah, I knew that GMU was right at the top of my list. Just, I spent, um, my final year at, uh, NMU, Dave did something that was extremely generous, which was spend, um, carved out office hour time just in one-on-one -on -one readings with me. And we, we started with methodology of economics, um, reading classic pieces in methodology, went through all of human action. Um, he tried to help me with uh, some of the um, applied micro material that I'd be getting in my first year uh, as a grad student and just really got me excited about a future in um, uh, academia and uh, being a professor and um, just going where higher ed would take you. And as I was reading more and just reading more outside of those readings, it was clear that Mason um, was the place you wanted to be if you wanted to do um, solid applied work, um, if you um, had like a predisposition that markets work and uh, that, you know, the, the property rights approach you were describing earlier is one that uh, is a really robust um, approach to solving world problems. And uh, you had just moved there. So there was a lot of momentum at GMU. So you have Buchanan, who's there uh, as kind of an anchor. Uh, Tyler Cowen, who um, little did we know was going to become the star that he is, um, was there. Uh, yourself, Pete. And then uh, a lot of other um, people who um, just were adding uh, to make Mason what it was at that moment in time. And uh, I went to Fee. Uh, you were by far the most uh, dynamic um, uh, speaker there. Got to get a lot of advice from you. And you were really candid uh, about your advice. You know, just um, you, you need to really want this to be the right place. And uh, it was an easy decision. And um, you cemented it driving me back to the airport and uh, getting me there alive. I was praying the whole time. Um, you drive in uh, in New York and New Jersey by driving, looking at me in your rear view mirror the whole time. So I don't know how you kept on the road, but you just kept making the cell while not looking at the road. And we somehow survived. So I, I can go with this guy. All right. I, 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 I was good in, good in the in the car, right? As they oh. say, with the coaches in the, good in the living room with the mom or whatever. Yes, I was good in the yeah. car. Um, so you show up in, in 2000, mm -hmm. you mentioned, uh, the faculty, actually one of the, uh, you know, dynamic people was the fact that Brian Kaplan was an oh, assistant yeah, professor yep. and, and, and he was like, uh, you know, there at that time. Yep. Um, so you come in, you have cohort, talk a little bit about the other people you went through graduate school with and, the relationships that you form with them over the years and, and, and whatnot. Sure. Uh, so, you know, one person that was there a year before you, who has been a co-author and remains a, a good friend before me by a year is Bob Subrix. I don't know if you recruited him, Pete or not, but uh, Tyler did. Tyler did. And did. I was, okay. and I, and I tried to get him before he went to Emory. Okay. This is the key issue because he was interested in Austrian economics, but he chose to go to Emory and then he was at Emory studying with Paul Rubin, and then he decided to come back, you know, to Mason. But I, I can remember sitting there in the spring sometime, and he was upstairs having a sandwich. I was downstairs. This is over at the Johnson Center. And I look up, and I see him, and he's with Tyler, and they're talking. And then I'm like, what, what, what's going on here? And then the next year, Bob shows up. It was awesome. So he's a 1999 guy, too. Got it. Okay. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. So my class, um, you know, a few of the people who have, I guess we're sample biased here, but we're looking at the people who might still be familiar and um, um, memorable. Ben Powell uh, was a classmate of mine, started in 2000. Uh, Anne Rathbone Bradley um, was a classmate. 
Um, there's a few others who have done fine for themselves outside of um, outside of higher ed. Jason Osborne, uh, Greg Cousteau, Adam Summers. Um, trying to think if there was anyone else, but it was a good group. Uh, we, like you were describing with Dave, uh, the days were just day after day of studying uh, in in the uh, library. Fen- Fenwick, is that right? Yeah, uh, so Fenwick Library and then uh, taking night classes. Uh, we had a lot of fun uh, after class uh, each evening. Uh, I learned a lot and really um, appreciated having Brian as my uh, 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 my TA relationship. Kaplan was in his early days writing a lot um, on the uh, refereed publication side and playing that game. Uh, but God, the guy was smart, enthusiastic, um, just really supportive as well. You know, so um, we we did, you know, a lot of things at his house outside of classes and just one of these people who, um, as you were doing as well, just really rallied um, kind of a culture and a spirit of this is our graduate program and we do things together as a, as a group. And fostering that culture is something that um, I'm learning now as a dean is so tricky and difficult to pull off. And you guys were doing it naturally in different pockets uh, at Mason. And yes, it predates a lot of the technology. It certainly predates COVID, um, but it, it, it really drives down to just people and personalities and a passion for um, kind of a shared set of goals. When we uh, moved out of Enterprise and we moved over into these new offices, um, so one of the big missing things in Enterprise was the lack of offices for the graduate students. So now we have our graduate students in like a cubicle bullpen. Uh, and they so anytime a professor comes out of the office, they bump into one of the graduate students. And we, Chris and I, Chris Coyne and I designed that, uh, you know, based on experiences that we had some other places about how we should organize this. Um, as you move through, as you move through graduate school, you also had some people behind you in your cohort that you develop very good relationships with. Absolutely. So, uh, you know, going back to the thinking and deciding on Mason, you know, a couple of people who were um, extremely influential uh, in it as well. Where I mentioned Bob, but uh, Ed Stringham uh, as well. Uh, you you all hosted me the spring of uh, spring of two thousand. Uh, you you had me out to campus and rolled out the red carpet. I got to sit in on a guest lectured class that Rizzo Mar- Mario Rizzo was doing. He was coming down from New York, uh, but Ed took me out afterwards and uh, was a really effective uh, salesman and uh, um, just made me realize that there is a group of people here who talk about ideas way beyond the classroom and are passionate about them. Uh, After being there a little bit, that class um, immediately behind me the next year was um, one of the most star-studded I think you've ever had. So it had Ryan Opria, Peter Leeson, and uh, Chris uh, Coyne, uh, you know, probably my best friend uh, in the world, uh, all in the same um, cohort. And they've all had um, tremendous success. And there's probably other ones that I'm um, forgetting, Abel Wynn, was in that group, uh, Steve Daly, who's done well in private sector. Uh, Diego, and, Diego. Uh, Diego, yeah. So I'm um, just an amazing uh, uh, group of people who um, have had disproportionate uh, influence. So I view them as not quite in my cohort, but uh, they're they're my colleagues now uh, in the profession, people I still watch and uh, keep track of. And now, it, you know, 20 years later, Mason has just exploded. And I, I don't know who all is who, but it seems to be they're doing great work. I'm always amazed that, uh, so, you know, we had a goal that we would have these, uh, what I always call five, you know, five tool, like stars in academics. They can talk to their peers in the scientific journals. They can, you know, teach, uh, you know, and be outstanding in the classroom and uh, like a life changing type teacher. Uh, they can, you know, do policy analysis if they're asked to do that. They can be public intellectuals. And then this fifth one is they want to be academic entrepreneurs. And it's very rare that an individual can be all five of those. Um, but it is amazing the cohort around which you coalesced, there's a disproportionate number of them. You know, I spent last spring down in, in Lubbock, Texas a large part of it with Ben and what he's built is just amazing. Uh, what you've done is just amazing, not only as a, as a teacher and as a, as a researcher, but then also as an entrepreneur, as an academic entrepreneur, both, you know, before you went into being a Dean and everything like that. Did you think about that? I mean, did that just evolve 
as part of your evolution? Like, you know, I'm running this, I'm teaching economics, I'm getting kids excited. Let me start a center, right? And then, you know, start a center, let me grow the center, you know, like how did that all like, you know, it's an amazing evolution, but it's something that you, that followed you in every university you've been at. Yeah. And it's by accident. You know, I, I think I still look back and um, there are times, I mean, this is, this is a hard job. There's no joke about it. And the stress uh, just really can grind on you. And there are times you look back and it's like, what the hell was I thinking? And how did this happen? You know, like uh, you get into higher ed because in my case, it was looking at Dave and saying, wow, that guy has a great life. He gets to think about ideas every day. He walks into a class and he gets to energize a group of students in economics. And whether you pursue economics to the graduate level or not, at least he's maybe turning on a light bulb or two. And what an amazing craft that must be. And I got into it thinking uh, professors read books and teach. The research piece um, was something that I only even realized professors were doing later in my um, graduate uh, undergrad, undergraduate training. It's like, oh, professors teach and read books. I, I don't know. Uh, and so the, the life of a professor seemed appealing to me. And then when you get in and start your career, um, it's a lot of fun researching and, uh, and teaching. And that is plenty fulfilling and uh, more than enough. But there are moments along the way where you get sucked into um, committee work or you get involved in uh, searches for positions or someone gets excited about your work and you raise a little bit of money and you realize um, the additional impact you're able to have um, just by doing a little bit more that's outside of the normal academic um, grind. And you do it and you're minimally competent at it and then you do it a little bit more and you realize there's a complete vacuum um, where there just aren't that many people who want to do it or who are good at it. And uh, um, you start to develop a capability uh, in it and it just uh, takes off from there. I never in my wildest dreams thought I would be doing admin. I still um, wake up a lot of the time uh, and just say, God, uh, what on earth? Like, how did this happen? It's almost entirely good. Like it's, it's really, my life is um, extremely full and complete. Uh, but it was not at all the plan. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, that's, <laughs> you know, that's how a lot of this stuff goes, yeah. though, right? But I, I, I you know, I, I want to talk to you more about that. But um, I want to go back to the research idea. I mean, I think that just just to so we talk about this later is that one of the things that I really benefit tremendously from um, is actually, you know, uh, Chris, both Chris and Virgil. Um, are here and they both have that same unbelievable ability to uh, just manage and think of new new programs to energize and you know new opportunities to spread the ideas we care about or new opportunities for people to have research opportunities and it's um, you know I I benefit from it tremendously and I hope and I I see the product of it our students certainly benefit from it tremendously and. Um, but so many people don't want to do that kind of work, and yet it's essential uh, for universities to operate and 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 make the most out of the research program. But let me step back a little bit. Um, you were able to do field research uh, when you were a graduate student um, uh, in the Czech Republic, and maybe you could talk a little bit about that, but more Botswana. Uh, so if you could talk a little bit more about your experiences in Botswana. And uh, and what the project was and how you got uh, excited about that and, and what was the biggest challenges and whatnot of trying to do research in Botswana. Yeah, so this all feels like lifetimes ago. I got to do Czech Republic field work with you twice, Pete. So um, three of my four summers at Mason um, were in the field. And I think it was a unique moment in uh, in kind of the history of economic ideas. It feels like the world has moved past the interest in um, the wealth and poverty of nations somewhat. So that moment in the early 2000s is a moment where you have the uh, Millennium Development Goals being developed. Bono is the biggest rock star in the world. Jeff Sachs is hot as can be um, as an economist. There are these big sweeping books, Jared Diamond's writing Gun, Guns, Germs, and Steel. Um, you've got uh, David Landis writing a book on the wealth and poverty of nations. Asimogu, Johnson, and Robinson are like three of the biggest names uh, in the profession. Easterly 
everyone is tackling why are some nations rich and others poor. And thanks to your own academic entrepreneurship, uh, Pete, some money somehow was raised uh, at Mason to send teams into the field. And uh, I got to go with you twice to the Czech Republic. And then thanks to, I don't know, some money somewhere, I uh, got to spend um, time about a month in uh, Botswana the final year. The Botswana project was building on some um, work I had already done and uh, um, had, had published. And I had be begun to um, be described as, you know, kind of one of these Western experts on what's going on in Botswana and providing a spin that's a little different on Botswana's success. So traditional spin is they're resource rich, they have lots of diamonds. Um, of course, they're going to be um, successful in defying Africa. And uh, I flipped that around and said, there's an entire resource curse literature that says they should not be rich, should not be prospering. And there's something different about their prosperity. And it has to do with the respect for the rule of law, Western institutions of property rights and um, really stable leadership. Uh, so there was a little bit of a, a niche there to raise my hand uh, and, uh, and develop a series of articles on, uh, on Botswana's economy. Going there for me, I think, was as much to develop um, street cred uh, as, uh, as a faculty member, uh, as a researcher on Botswana. It's really hard to say I'm an expert on something and I've never been there. Uh, so I think that it, it really helped me. Uh, I still I have a standing invite from the University of Botswana to come spend a year there. Now that's really hard to be a Dean and spend a year in Botswana. So it's like, maybe I can go 30 years from now or something. Uh, but uh, but it was, it was fabulous being there. Um, being there for me was confirmation that it really is a stable country. Um, we had received all kinds of advice ahead of time about all the risks uh, and, uh, you know, loaded up on a ton of shots. And it's like a normal, it, it, it feels like, um, Greece or, uh, you know, um, Portugal, like not, not Paris, you know, not the United Kingdom, but middle income Europe. And uh, it was good to go there and discover that um, firsthand. Fieldwork uh, um, in a civilized place um, like Botswana or the Czech Republic isn't really even fieldwork. It, it's you're, you're, you're trying to schedule interviews. It, it actually reminds me a lot of um, fundraising now. You are trying to fill your calendar with a lot of prospects. Some of the meetings are total garbage. And then you have some that are just like pure gems where you're like, that's exactly what I was trying to capture. And uh, we, we did a lot of that um, for three years in a row. Yeah, that's awesome. I, one of my funniest memories is you and I, uh, you know, people ask me why I ended up by, you know, shifting out of doing stuff in Moscow and moved centered in Prague. And the reason was very materialistically, which is that when I went to Prague, they put me in the Hyatt and uh, and took care of me. And remember, we were in the business lounge at the Hyatt and we're at the computer there talking about our stuff. And Pete Leeson is in a rural section of Romania talking to us on, on a on a, uh, you know, uh, 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 on the email, and he's like describing that he and Chris have sun poisoning because they 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 stayed out in the sun too long, and that they haven't had running water or anything like that. And we're sitting there like asking for another pina colada from the you know from the drinks. We're like, hey, another pina colada. Hey, it's good for you. You know, if it doesn't kill you, it'll make you stronger. How's the interviews going? Uh, but yeah, I mean. Uh, but still, nevertheless, Botswana was, a, 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 you know, such an amazing story because it's the it's this outlier uh, from the, uh, you know, being trapped in a low growth equilibrium. Right. And um, and so that was the big puzzle to try to crack. And and, uh, you know, you went about taking that puzzle on, which was, yeah, was just great. Um, so then. Uh, we're now finished graduate school, you have your, you know, about to have your PhD handed to you and you're in the job market. Uh, you did get an offer from to go live in Malibu <laughs> and, and instead you chose to go to Macon, Georgia instead. Uh, and and uh, you go down to Mercer and you build a, a, a great program down there. Um, but, you know, uh, explain a little bit about the beginnings of your career as a professor and you didn't have other people. Well, you did have at Mercer. You had a supportive faculty with you, uh, Skip Mounts and some other ones who were. But uh, talk a little bit about that experience about being a young assistant professor teaching 
principals classes and, you know, living in, in Macon, Georgia. Yeah, you know, uh, definitely one of those fork in the road moments that you look back on and you say, what would life have been? Um, the Malibu opportunity in uh, Pepperdine uh, sure would have been something. Uh, but, you know, I'm a young professor. I can remember the starting pay at the two places. And remember, I, I grew up dirt poor. So um, money and cost of living and all of these things that um, matter to people, matter disproportionately to someone who's like, God, I, I, I don't want to be poor in life. And I visited Malibu and the highest they would have been able to offer was 80, uh, 80,000. That's like really great money. Um, but, uh, um, the cost of living there was such that you could either like, you could own a house that they owned the land under on Pepperdine. And it was like a half million dollar house, or you could like live in a trailer park, like, I don't know, it was like 200 miles away or something. And I just, I couldn't stomach that. Um, even it would have been like a, an opportunity for my wife to get out and be working and be a, um, she could have advanced a lot more in her career, but we just cannot wrap our minds around um, how are we going to afford things and pay for them. Uh, so we made the odd choice of turning down Malibu for Macon uh, and Macon was offering less money. Uh, it was, I can remember it being 65 as opposed to 80 but Macon's an extremely affordable place. And on top of that 65, they had one thing going that um, still blows my mind. But if you published um, every refereed article, didn't matter where, they were just trying to get AACSB accredited, but every article was an $8,000 check immediately that got added to your comp. So I'm a young professor. I've got my dissertation that can easily be published. I've got co-authors. Uh, and uh, it was quite easy to max out at four articles a year for those first few years. And that's 32,000 extra. So it was almost 100K as someone in 2004 uh, just started out. And, uh, and, and so it was purely, I mean, just like, I mean, narrow money maximization that brought me to Macon. But there were some really great people there. And you mentioned one of them, Skip Mounts, who was the, uh, he was the associate dean when I started. He became the interim dean. He's a dean now um, in Georgia, Coastal College of Georgia, and just a really good early career mentor. And uh, one of the um, nicest and uh, most authentic people uh, you'll ever meet. Uh, so I, I had a, a wonderful time there. They just let me be me. Um, I, um, I'm a different kind of economist. I don't like model and measure a whole hell of a lot. <laughs> and, uh, um, you know, I nonetheless um, was publishing uh, at an extraordinarily high rate because I either had co-authors who could do some of the technical things and I'm a decent writer uh, or I was asking um, okay questions in uh, non-technical areas and um, did what I needed to. I, I never have thought of myself as a great researcher, but it was uh, more than enough and good. Uh, the teaching side, we moved a major from um, nearly zero students to about 30 students. We attracted monies for a bb and professorship that I held um, while I was there. Uh, and also a, a, a center that uh, helped us bring in. I think you came to Mercer twice. We got to bring Becky to Mercer. We brought Vernon Smith uh, and a lot of other um, really big names to uh, Mercer to engage our students. And uh, it was a wonderful place to start my career. I, I loved it there. Um, it, it's, it was a Baptist university, but they actually, they swung so hard in the direction of respecting academic freedom because they were Baptist, um, that in ways it was the most um, tolerant place I've been on issues of free speech and like wokeness and everything. Um, they were just really good on uh, all of those dimensions too. Yeah. Um, also during your time there, they had a run on their basketball uh, team that went really well and, and their coach actually ended up by uh, winning the coach of the year, national coach of the year yes. award. Yeah, Mark Sloniker. Yep, yep, yep. yep. And uh, another small world thing that Mark Sloniker and I worked at basketball camp uh, together as counselors uh, when uh, I was, uh, you know, in my early in my uh, late teens, and I was doing that uh, as as my summer. And Mark was uh, great, uh, and I grew up in the town right next to him, and uh, you know, watched him be a great basketball player. Unfortunately, against our my high school too. So, so he, he played at university of Georgia. Uh, and then, you know, and then after Mercer, he went back to university of Georgia. Um, but, uh, uh, but it was, I was thrilled when, uh, uh, you know, he was there. And so you, uh, um, you know, what, that's one of the things I, I, I guess, uh, I wanted to ask you about because you did build from 
a school that was lacking in majors, and then you were able to put butts in the seats in the major, um, that's a unique skill and a very important skill. Because I think a lot of people might not realize that faculty lines, uh, you know, faculty budgets all get determined by what they call, you know, FTE, how many, how many students you can actually generate in your, in your idea. And you were able to do that. Um, what do you attribute that to? Uh, did you do extracurricular things for the students like these speakers, or was it just that you got a groundswell from getting people interested in economic way of thinking? It's my good looks, Pete. That's all it was. <laughs> <you know? laughs> so, uh, no, it, I think the extracurriculars certainly were a draw uh, to our program, but I, I think it, it goes back to like the basics that Dave um, offered me as a student. If you actually care about the ideas of economics, it's hard not to get extremely excited and to be passionate about them. And if you wear that passion on your sleeve in the classroom, um, it has a natural spillover effect on students who are undecided, um, students who recognize and need, just need to be told that an econ major can be a pathway to law school, an econ major can be a pathway to it, extremely high returns in the in the labor market. Um, econ is maybe the fourth uh, highest paying major. If you look at some of the surveys on um, you know, non-engineering uh, majors, it, it does very well. And I'm um, just communicating to students that there is a life in this discipline. Um, if you like it and enjoy it, um, uh, certainly seem to pay off there. So I, I don't know um, the, the the early growth and uh, the passion that Skip and a guy named Alan Lynch, who really loved uh, economics, had for it, helped us hire a couple of more people. We had uh, Sean Mulholland and Angela Dills there, who are a really good um, husband and wife couple at Western Carolina now. Um, Andreas Marroquin is uh, still there um, uh, and uh, came well behind me, but uh, there are remnants of uh, of a, the program a, still a there. GMU, a GMU program, somewhat. Yeah, yeah, no, that's great. So after uh, Mercer, uh, you moved to Troy, um, and uh, did you move as department chairman at Troy, or did you just move originally as a faculty member? Uh, I was a chair to chair um, move. Yeah, so I was chair at Mercer. Uh, and had an endowed chair at Mercer, the uh, BBMT chair, and then moved to Troy as department chair of a bigger department. It was economics and finance combined. And um, uh, what was the title? Uh, an Adams Bibby chair of uh, free enterprise. And then uh, you eventually build the Manley Johnson Center uh, there. Um, and then you're able to have a group of faculty and you're building a lot of momentum. You take a lot of those um, external programs that you were talking about and replicate them again at Troy. And you have a lot of student movements. You sponsor uh, conferences as well, uh, you know, that students come in. Um, how long were you at Troy? Five years. <clears throat> yeah. And, uh, yeah. And, and how about again with the majors? Do you remember? No uh, major. There was no major. Um, like that had to get approved by the Alabama Commission for Higher Ed. Um, you know, I when I got recruited and it was a targeted recruitment. Um, I can remember a few meetings, um, including a pitch from Manley to move to Troy. Uh, and we had a lot of skepticism about moving. You know, we're Midwesterners, didn't know we wanted to do another move um, in the Deep South. Uh, Troy is a small um, town. It's a wonderful college town. It's just, it's small. And uh, we're, we weren't sure that we wanted that to be the next move. Um, but Manley, um, Rich Fink, uh, and uh, Jack Hawkins, the uh, president at uh, Troy University, who is still the president, um, just made a really convincing um, sell to just put in some time. Uh, it'd be a great place. In fact, the sell was if you do th good things here administratively, you can write your own ticket. And they actually were pretty right um, about that. And I came in and there was nothing to work from, really. There was no major. Um, there were two faculty who were retiring from economics, who were wonderful people, but they were on their way out. And economics was just this discipline, like you could get a track or a concentration in economics, but no major. And I had the support of a good dean. He's still the dean there, Judson Edwards, and uh, was just told, do what you need to, um, to build. So a few things that he allowed me to do um, very early on were just recruit um, the faculty that I needed unencumbered from a lot of bureaucracy and process. So I was able to build, uh, hire three immediately, um, Dan Sutter, Dan Smith, who's uh, doing great stuff at MTSU, and then George Crowley. And uh, we got going on 
um, developing some new courses and getting a major going so that students had some reason to study economics. And by the time I left, um, five years later, we went from zero majors to 100. There was a steady state of 100 majors at the undergrad level. And we had also launched a master's program, uh, an applied master's program that's meant to be a feeder to places like Mason and uh, Texas Tech and West Virginia. And I think that the master's program, I, I haven't checked, but I think it's doing um, pretty well as well. So we were extremely entrepreneurial. We got those first three um, positions. And then, um, you know, being the Department of Economics and Finance chair, I was able to work in that space of, hey, we have a finance line. Maybe there's economist, an economist who does enough finance to fit. So we hired Thomas Hogan, who was there for a little while uh, and found other ways. I don't even remember how, but we found other ways to hire um, John Dove and... Um, Malavika uh, Nair and uh, what's his name, GP Manish. So we had seven or eight people who I think um, we would all call part of the part of the the, the broader um, market movement, or you know who have who have been trained in places that um, care about Adam Smith and the history of ideas, and uh, they all were in one place at one time. And uh, to this day, I think Troy is mentioned along with maybe five to ten places as. Um, they do market oriented work. It's just at mainly an undergrad and master's level, you know, and you'd say like Mason Tech, Texas Tech, West Virginia, um, Troy comes slipping off of a lot of people's tongues. Um, yeah, it does. And, it's, and it was always uh, it, it both Mercer and Troy, uh, despite, you know, the reputation of being in the South, they're beautiful schools. The schools themselves are absolutely gorgeous and the amenities around it. So, now I'm going to make people think I'm really weird. But one of my favorite things about Troy is the little airplane at the football games that uh, when they kick a field goal, the little airplane only goes out to, uh, you know, uh, the, 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 the midfield and then comes back. But if it, if it does a touchdown, it makes the whole trip all the way through. And, and, and the reality is, is that Troy actually is a very, very, uh, you know, competitive Division I sports school. Um, in its conference, but it plays up and plays big time things. And during the time that you were there, it was exciting because you had quarterbacks that were like video games and throwing the ball all over the place. And so it made for great, uh, you know, atmosphere. And then they built the new basketball arena uh, and everything. And uh, so uh, it had a lot of amenities that help. And the school itself is just beautiful. And then the, the Manley Johnson Center and the space that they gave you uh, in the business school was beautiful too. Absolutely. And uh, you can't understate um, the importance of Manly in all of this too. I mean, just to talk about a uh, tremendous American patriot. He um, was supportive. He was hands off, uh, but he cared deeply about what we were doing. My turn towards um, less academic work, Botswana and Czech Republic and, you know, different um, refereed pieces that nobody's reading um, towards policy happened there too, because there was this um, drive both from the university administration, but also Manly to have, you know, some kind of impact on the world. And if you think about that time, it's 2010 to 2015, there are a lot of people really bothered post um, 2008. So Manly is this former, he's this former Federal Reserve chairman, and he's looking at all of the rules of banking going out the window and uh, hoped that his, his center would tackle things like overregulation and you know banking arbitrariness, and uh, we did our best uh, to address that, and then address some state issues uh, that related to cronyism and um, just like very old ways of doing things in the state of Alabama. So um, there's another turn in my life. I never thought I would want to stick my neck out into the policy arena. Um, it's okay. It's not. It's not like it's not tremendously fun to do that, but it was part of the job. But we also believe that economics, that relevance is a virtue, not a vice, you know, whereas maybe some other traditions in economics think of relevance as something that the mushy headed people do or whatever. You know, we think, you know, in many ways, the purpose of theory is to do history and contemporary history is public policy. And so we always are sticking our necks out in these things. You you stuck your neck out in a in a big way in Botswana, but that's an abstract policy. Now you're sticking your neck out in a very concrete policy. And I remember when I was visiting 
Troy once and um, I had written something about the Fed and, you know, the, 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 you know, maybe it might've even been with you on the deficits, debt and debasement stuff. And uh, Manly like comes up to me and he says, well, you've persuaded me, uh, you know, uh, but it's, it, 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 it's only because they're behaving badly, <laughs> you know, <laughs> if they didn't behave that badly, then that, um, so you build this program, by the way, the, the, again, like the program at Mercer, I was at a conference just to let you know. So I was at a conference at a school in New York, uh, last year. Um, and, uh, I think it was last year. And, uh, there were three faculty members from Mercer that were at the conference as well. Um, and so it still is in existence. And of course, Troy is still very much in existence. George has moved on to be an administrator there as well as, as you, uh, but, uh, you know, uh, uh, Dan Sutter, you know, even has his own podcast, uh, you know, uh, and, uh, but GP and Malavika are still there and, and training graduate students, um, and, uh, or, you know, through the master's program. And we get, you know, the, ma- we get at least one master's student every couple of years that decides to do their work with us here. So it's still amazing what you did there and built up, uh, now you now you have a great opportunity. You move on to Arizona State University. Here's a theme, by the way, to everyone, is that Scott's very entrepreneurial and he moves on in increments of five years, basically. Um, and uh, and he moves to Arizona State University. And so you're a serial academic entrepreneur um, and you create a new center at this major university, uh, Arizona State University. And and uh, so that's a pretty exciting time as well. And you live right at the, at the foots of uh camel mountain or whatever it's called. And yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. That's one we can fast forward though. No, yes. no, no, I know. I, we're not gonna, no. But I mean, it's, uh, the, uh, it's, it's an amazing experience of, it was. of and, learning uh, the, things. There were, I mean, there was a lot learned there in, uh, in a short time. I was there um, just under two years and uh, um, it was a, it was one of those cases in life for me where I should have listened to my gut. Everything about the way I was being brought in smelled bad and like I wasn't going to succeed. And I nonetheless did it because I wanted to live in Phoenix, Arizona, and I wanted to work in this most innovative university in the country and learn and be around excellence. Um, I still would not be where I am today without the stop at Arizona State. Um, Michael Crow, the president there, is um, a, uh, a, a friend, um, someone that uh, remains a reference and uh, someone I have high respect for. Um, I, um, I can't tell you what an amazingly fast and uh, innovative culture um, uh, ASU offers, but it was um, just a it was it was a mess to try to build um, under the circumstances I was uh, you know, it's to be able, like trying to colonize Mars and it just, it didn't work. And uh, the best thing to do, and, uh, I mean, the, the lesson in it is just um, walk away and find something a lot better um, if you can. So I, I think that we learn a lot. So my, my professor and Dave's professor, Kenneth Bolding, uh, told us many years ago that economics would advance much faster if people allowed us to see their waste baskets. And I think that's true of life in general that we probably learn more from our failures than we ever do from our successes. And I don't consider what happened to you to be a failure, so don't get that wrong. But I think we learn from our difficulties or our challenges. And you know, you were uh, put in a situation that was very difficult, but yet nevertheless, you still succeeded uh, actually. And the two years you were there, you built things, you had things going. And so much so, in fact, like you said, that the president still recommends you and and is a friend and whatnot, but also you now became the youngest dean in an ASCSB accredited university in the whole United States. How, I mean, how amazing is that? And what was that like? And how do you check your ego and, you know, and, and these kind of things by this meteoric rise you know, through, you know, these things and you find yourself at, again at North Dakota State, again, by the way, in a, in a place that has an amazing set of amenities in Fargo and 
uh, you know, a college town and uh, national championship level football team. And, and Carson Wentz is in his, uh, his heyday or whatever, leading the, leading the bison to national champions. What's that like for you going there and, and now having that challenge? Yeah, it's, it was amazing. Uh, NDSU was a fabulous um, six years of uh, leading a team that I love. And I'm still pretty fresh, um, re- freshly removed from NDSU. So there's people I love and, uh, and miss. Um, being a dean never was a goal, but it just came at, you know, this, I mean, out of, out of misery comes opportunity in some respects. I had hit the end of my um, rope at, uh, at ASU and just wanted some kind of reset or something different. It just, things were not um, working well and got a call about NDSU. And I remember saying, uh, I'm not really interested in moving right now, not really looking. Uh, and then got a follow-up saying, we really think you'd be strong. And, you know, when you get a second call saying, would you please consider, there's actually some pretty sincere interest and uh, um, made it through the search process, um, got to lead a wonderful college of about 1,600 students, um, oh, 40 to 50 um, faculty at any time, and then another um, 10 or 15 staff. Uh, it's a land grant um, and uh, a really big deal in the upper Midwest uh, as a university. I love working in land grants. I'm in another one now. And that focus on research having the impact to other audiences is a really big deal and something that they actually take seriously at uh, NDSU and at University of Wyoming. Uh, and then the drive for access. So we keep our standards really down so that look really low so that everyone has a chance at college. Uh, and that just goes right back to my roots. That's what Northern Michigan did for me. And I played well uh, in that space and uh, had a lot of success there. So. A um, couple of highlights. We were dealing with a real AACSB nightmare when I got there. We got that cleaned up. And then five years later, got a continuation of AACSB a second time. So those are, I mean, that's a really big deal to sustain accreditation and to go through the second time unblemished. We didn't have any problems um, at all. Raised a, a ton of money um, and uh, created another center um, that has um, some really great younger uh, scholars in it. This is the biggest one of uh, any of them I created. It's a um, $35 million um, institute. It is meant to span all of campus and uh, engage people in innovation, entrepreneurship, and the ideas of economics anywhere on campus. So if you want to tackle the questions that that institute is tackling, we want to be a partner um, anywhere on campus. So we were support- supporting faculty positions in political science in cybersecurity, uh, in uh, um, engineering, uh, and then in core business disciplines uh, as well. And when I left, I think they had hired eight or nine of 15 ten- tenure track faculty. Uh, Bob Lawson's daughter, uh, Carrie Lawson, is uh, one of the people I am proud to have recruited to it. She's, she's great. She's a young scholar and uh, doing really nice work. And uh, um, yeah, it's, it's a program that made a lot of sense for um, the upper Midwest, trying to just tackle um, issues of opportunity and human flourishing. And now you've moved on to Wyoming. And uh, so you're just freshly there. So I guess that one of the questions that uh, in your experience that you've been involved in now building centers, building, you know, let's, let's do it the right way. Generating majors, building centers, running departments, running schools, uh, you hear a lot of, of uh, naysayers about higher ed uh, and the future of higher ed and, and whatnot. What do you consider when you, you know, in your leadership role, the challenges that you see to higher education coming down the pike? And they could be demographic challenges. They could be uh, intellectual challenges. Uh, they could be, uh, you know, financial challenges. But where do you see the challenges and how are you strategically thinking about those things? Yeah, so I think we're actually in the same um, independent review issue coming up here, Pete. I, I have a piece in on higher ed. Are you in that one too? Oh, never mind. Well, I've got a uh, piece coming out, <laughs> so, and I, you know, I think that the demographic one is uh, very real and going to get quite a bit worse uh, come 2026. And demographics, to some extent, are destiny for higher ed because there's not consolidation. You don't have mergers and acquisitions. Um, you're not going to get, you're not going to have the University of Alaska merge with the University of Maine. So you have all of this duplication and uh, um, 
less demand um, with the same or maybe even growing supply. Um, that that one is uh, fairly significant. But the the thesis of this uh, this short piece um, for independent review is the biggest risk to higher ed is just ourselves. Um, the um, the infighting and the bickering, and now this echo chamber element of you have to have the same values and ideas and everyone needs to speak a certain way. And if you're different than that, um, you get, I mean, you, in the extreme, you get canceled. Um, but uh, um, in the in the less extreme version, you're self-censoring and being very careful about everything you say. And that's completely opposite of what universities are about and uh, should be about, which is challenge um, a lot of ideas on the table and the best ideas rising to the top. So I think that the concern that I have more than anything um, is I love my team. I love um, working around some of the most creative and smart people um, on the planet, um, but they don't even see their own um, vulnerability that's being created by being so narrow and uh, so single-minded in uh, how they think about things. It's you, you put a post up on this the other day that I think is spot on um, about higher ed though, Pete, and it's there are disciplines and colleges like the arts that have completely lost their way. But then there is a core of higher ed that is still focused, like building a bridge is still focused on building a bridge. And I think that that remains intact. And the scientists have just pulled down their, um, their shade and said, we're going to keep doing science. And um, higher ed will be just fine, 80% um, of it anyway, because they're not being impacted by the, the noise and the rancor. Yeah, I think that the conversations that caught your attention when Dave was talking to historians and philosophers still can be conversations that we have in the university. In fact, I know uh, that they're conversations that we can have. Um, and that's what the university is really about, this contested conversation. And we just need to, you know, continue to stand for those values and whatnot. And, you know, obviously that's what you do in your position every day. You wake up and you do that. I do think on the demographic challenge, the reality is, is that we have to have high quality universities that attract students from abroad. And that's the only way that we can face the declining birth rate issue. You know, we're no longer in the baby boom. And, and so we need to have, I was listening to one of my colleagues the other day, uh, inform me that one in five adults that is 25 years uh, old at the moment is Indian. And in the world, and uh, and that that number is gonna, you know, uh, go up over you know time. The the share of Indians in the world population. And the first thought that came to my head was, oh my God, we got to get them on our online master's program because <laughs> that way we can we can grow that thing, and we should be promoting that over in India, you know, to make sure that uh, you know I would love to teach like you know a, a thousand Indian students about you know the economics and and, and the power of it and all. And so I think that that's, uh, you know, we just have to be creative and we got to actually fight against some of the, you know, phobia against having large demographic inflows of people. And, and because that's what we need for our universities to flourish and, and, and whatnot, which also brings with it a tremendous new set of ideas and new ways of thinking and new perspectives. And so it would be a win win all around. Anyway, I'm very mindful of your time. I know that I, I know that you're a, a you know a busy guy, um, but I wanted to ask you one other thing. I've I've peppered our conversation talking a little bit about uh, uh, sports as we gone through, and the reality is is that in your academic career, which has been very busy, you've also had another career, uh, you know, besides being a super dad and 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 a wonderful husband. You've also been, uh, uh, you know, close to a world class, if not world class marathoner running in the Boston Marathon and, and all of that. Um, you know, how have you found the time for the training of that and and uh, and and the commitment that's involved? Does it help you clear your mind? Uh, you know, all of that stuff. And, uh, uh, you know, yeah. Talk a little bit about about that. And by the way, are you going to break two 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 hours? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we'll be, uh, I'm, still, I'm still trying to do a sub three. I'm right at the I'm knocking on the door, but I'm getting old. You know, it's not uh, not as easy, and the time commitment is real. I do have this ad advantage now that Laramie's at seventy two hundred feet, 
And if you can run up here, uh, when you drop down, you get a huge elevation advantage. You're like so, the Kenyans. Yes. You're like the Kenyans. Uh, yes. so. I, was, I was back east last week and uh, never felt so good running. Uh, just it, it is a really big effect. Yeah, I don't know. Um, I'm a restless person. I need outlets for it. And if I don't um, get in my own head exercising and uh, doing things for myself, I can be really destructive. Uh, and uh, the destructiveness can be, you know, just that extra drink that you have at night when you normally have one, you have three. And uh, running really tires you out and uh, you're completely exhausted and you just don't feel like um, destroying yourself in other ways. You know, so it, it actually is a crutch for me um, in keeping myself on just better decisions um, uh, with, with. Are you a, are you an early morning runner or an afternoon no, runner? Always morning. No, I can't do afternoon. I, I will if I absolutely have to, but I don't like how I feel uh, in the afternoon. So I'm up early. Um, I fit it in just by being ruthless about my time and not sleeping enough. You know, so I'm I'm up. Uh, you know, often when I'm in training uh, at five and uh, trying to just get a run in before um, the day really gets crazy. Winter time's a little easier, if you can believe that, because you're doing some treadmill running and I can be on my treadmill watching the kids and you're multitasking, you know, um, but it's it's difficult. I am sitting on this Boston Marathon um, acceptance right now. They've accepted me. I My ticket is punched to do Boston in the spring, but I don't know. Um, it's it's a lot of work. <laughs> so, you ran you ran Boston. Boston you ran Boston Marathon when Ben was still teaching there, and I he did. came out and cheered you on, right? I, I did. Yep, and uh, it was it, it's a great memory. It was uh, it, the the starting temperature that day was eighty two degrees. I finished and it was eighty seven, and twenty twenty percent of the field did not finish, and I got to the finish line, sweaty and swampy. You know, Ben has this uh, phrase in his book, um, swamp ass. And yeah. that, came from, that came from me and I didn't get cited for it. I didn't get credit for it. Um, there's no footnote that that word came from me. I just it, used it. Yeah, it I just from, used it a week ago. <laughs> it came from that day in Boston and make sure to tell him that. It, uh, you know, I was so swampy. And rather than just be able to get a shower, Ben took me straight to a bar. So I just stayed swampy all afternoon. Yeah, that's really awesome. Awesome. yeah. I, I went over to the gym with my son to, to do some things. I'm trying to do some rehab things. And, and I went through and he pushed me a little too hard. And I told him when we got in the car, I just used it. I had no idea that that comes from you. Yeah. So I'm going to yeah. have to footnote you now. Please do. Yes. And he should have in that book. And I, I could have yeah, yeah. been, you know, world famous at this point. But I, I guess that the the I guess I'm trying to push you to just say, you know, I want to know like how it affects because you are your fire your brain has to be firing all the time. Cause you're you're putting out fires and thinking about new ways to do things and new programs. And the running, I guess, this is one of the things Chris Chris is also he doesn't run marathons, but he stays very fit. And he advises all the graduate students to walk, like walk, you know, an hour every day or something like that. And it's to put your mind at ease and 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 be able to reorient yourself and whatever. And I and I just you know how how important as you mentioned it on a personal level, but how about at a professional level the confidence that you have by being able to be at that level of athletic skill and you know working with uh, you know can you yep. just talk a little bit about so, that? There are definitely um, benefits from it. So one is you get extreme clarity from the chemicals that are flowing on like a really hard workout. I have to come home actually after runs and make sure not to type a note or do something that I thought about while I was running. So you get this extreme clarity on what you should do and you actually should back off from that a little bit often because it's like the extreme flight or flight reaction, but it often will bring you to like, okay, that's the direction um, that I should go. So it's like, maybe I need to get rid of a person and on the run, you're sitting there going, I know how I've worked out how to do it. Uh, and then you need to just back off of that and say, OK, that is that is like the extremely competitive approach to the problem. And now I better um, slow down here just a little bit. So it, it, it has that element um, on the confidence um, side. I just I can't believe I'm 45 years old. I'm extremely fit. Um, you know, I'm I'm able to keep up with my kids mostly. Uh, and that, you know, I, I feel like I'm 30 years old and still just kicking butt, you know, so it, it, it allows you to have energy, um, as you go about your day. 
um, that is needed because each day in uh, the saddle here is uh, a day of full um, energy depletion. Like you, I could, I could work 20 hours a day and uh, it just keeps coming. Yeah. So let me just wrap up with uh, one last question about Wyoming, which I think is amazing. What you did was, and talk a little bit about your department. You have a fantastic alumnus in John List, one of the greatest economists in the world. He has a new book out now about scalability, which is, I just listened to a wonderful podcast of his, and I, I'm totally um, enchanted with the idea because it relates to not just organizations, but actually how you spread ideas. And I'm in the idea spreading business, and I've had too little voltage. <laughs> and so I want to have more. And so I'm trying to learn. But <clears throat> but you also had Vernon Smith up already and Candace um, very early in your deanship. Um, tell us a little bit about the people that you're working with there that care about experimental economics, that were a faculty that, uh, you know, were able to train uh, someone like John List, who's been able to have a meteoric rise. Uh, just to, to sell sell us all a little bit on Wyoming a little bit. Uh, it's an amazing place. Um, so, you know, I, I don't know what Wyoming's reputation is nationally or uh, back east, probably a flyover state, but it's one of the most beautiful places um, as a state that a person could ever visit. Not only, I just got back from a conference in Jackson Hole. That's where I get to go for conferences is arguably the best mountain range um, in the world. And that's my backdrop for days while I'm just on a retreat for the university. Uh, so the natural beauty here is um, unbelievable. Uh, every weekend we're, we're, we have boxes that we're unpacking. We're trying to do a remodel. But every weekend we make it a point to get out to one of the two mountain ranges. We're, we're, we're tucked in between mountains and uh, we have not yet duplicated a trail uh, in our three months here. We're just on different trails every weekend, seeing more moose than we are people. And uh, it's just beautiful. And then we have Fort Collins 45 minutes away in Denver, two hours. So uh, we have the convenience of going down um, in elevation and having big cities. Um, but it's just, it's, it's dreamlike up here. I was drawn here um, for a few reasons. They're, they're paying really great money uh, and uh, certainly money matters, um, as we talked about earlier. Uh, it's a land grant like NDSU, but it's an FBS land grant that is in the Mountain West. They're doing things on a slightly bigger um, scale than NDSU. Uh, great football and, uh, and just um, the only university in the state of Wyoming. So you have some um, nimble elements by being the only player in town. Uh, and then because of the econ department, uh, I was leading NDSU and economics, which is my home discipline, was in another college, the College of Agriculture. Here, I have a world-class econ program in the college. They're celebrating their 50th year of a PhD program this coming fall. Uh, John, of course, is uh, probably our most famous uh, alumnus in the program, uh, and uh, what a fabulous run he has had. But we have a program that have the fathers of marketable um, market trading permits uh, in environmental pollution. The fathers of them came um, from University of Wyoming, so you can look that up. Uh, we have a top 10 program in the world in environmental econ. Uh, these guys, there's about 14 of them, and they are punching so far above their weight. I was visiting with one of them the other day extremely emotional about his experience at University of Wyoming. He says, I wake up every day, my entire day is focused on what can I do to help the PhD program at the University of Wyoming. And you just don't have that many people wired that they will make a decision based on one criteria. Is it helping the doctoral program at University of Wyoming or not? You know, and so there, it's a it's a team that really love what they're doing. And you can't believe um, the passion and the energy that these um, 14 guys have. They're getting, uh, they just out-competed um, several Ivy League schools and several universities way bigger um, for a major NSF grant. Um, and, uh, and they're doing that kind of work uh, all the time. So I'm, I'm loving it here. I love that group. Uh, and the college as a whole is, uh, is just an unbelievable platform to, uh, to just um, try to drive change. So, you know, these podcasts go out to a lot of prospective students and whatnot. And I think that, you know, it's it's a tremendous opportunity for a young person uh, that is interested in expanding their uh, vista about what possible potential graduate schools to consider to actually think about Wyoming. And and I hope that they do. And, and uh, they have this strong group, as you said, in environmental economics and that 
is going to be a field that becomes more and more important uh, for us. And the fact that they had the people on the, you know, uh, permits and the tradable permits means that they're thinking in terms of price system and property rights and adaptation and everything and not just mitigation strategies. And so it's actually like economics a lot come alive, right? Economics with attitude and economics come alive. And so, you know, go study where Scott's at. That's always been a, that's always been a very important thing. So anyway, Scott, thank you so much. Uh, all the best to Anemone and the kids. Uh, and, uh, um, you know, and, and uh, I hope that you run in, in the Boston Marathon and that you break all the records that you personally have done now that you're training at high elevation. Yeah, and, well, thank uh, you. And Pete, before I go, uh, two more things. Uh, we have Jay Shogren on our faculty, too, and he used to play against Kevin McHale uh, in basketball. So uh, he's um, a, an unbelievable economist. And then I mentioned Dave, and it's easy to give him a shout out when we're talking about him, but he's not here. But uh, the gratitude I have for you. I don't get to see you nearly as much uh, anymore. Um, I'm just, I'm busy as hell. I can't even make it back for board meetings uh, on the East Coast anymore, but uh, I can't thank you enough for all you've done um, for me and wouldn't be here without you too. So um, well, Scott, you, you know that, you know that those feelings are mutual yep. because we never would have been able to scale up our program unless we had super talented and very dedicated students that were the demonstration effect that said we could continue to build programs when people didn't think we could, you know, you remember, you know, the attitudes of everything. And so we were able to have people pursue market process economics, entrepreneurship, economics, political economy of development and get placed and do outstanding work. So thank you. So you bet. Uh, great to see you. Thanks so much. Thank you for listening to the Hayek Program podcast. To learn more about the research, scholars, and work of the Hayek Program, visit hayek.mercatus.org. For more information about graduate student fellowship opportunities for students at Mason, as well as at universities across the globe, please visit students.mercatus.org. We hope you recommend students to our programs or consider applying yourself.